Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, New Poetry Society with me, uh, Henry Normal, and uh, we're live on Zoom for the next hour. And um, I'd like to thank uh, the Nottingham Poetry Festival uh, to Confetti um, and Metronome, who are doing all the technical work and uh, sorting this out for you. Um, also, Inspire, uh, which is um, which works with the Nottinghamshire Libraries, uh, the Nottingham County Council, and the Arts Council, and the Nottingham Trent University. So, lots of people involved uh, to bring this to you. Um, we're going to have some fun uh, for the next hour. Uh, we're going to read some poetry, and we're going to have some questions from you. Now, we have a chat facility down the side. Um, I'm saying down the side there, it might be a different side for you, but uh, down the side. And um, halfway through, if you want to start asking questions, uh, then uh, my special guest today uh, will answer some questions and I might answer them as well. And there's also a Q&A um, facility as well for the same sort of thing, really, so you can use either. Um, so... This is episode nine. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've seen any of the others. Uh, if not, where you been? But uh, this is a really good one today because uh, it's one of my favourite uh, poets in uh, Nottingham. In fact, uh, a poet that was actually um, voted the Young Poet Laureate of Nottingham uh, back in 2017. She's the was the creative director of the Nottingham Poetry Festival for the last two years. And uh, she was the founder, or is the founder, I should say, uh, of Mud Press and also a brilliant poet. So please welcome Georgina Wilding. Hiya, Georgie. Hey, nice to see you. And you. Uh, um, so how's, uh, how's um, lockdown been for you? Oh, it's been a whirlwind. It's been a whirlwind. Lots of ups and downs like everybody else. Jobs coming and going, but I've got really into gardening. So if you see my garden now, it's like a massive wildflower meadow with lots of big, amazing plants in there. So that's been that's been keeping me sane, I think. Oh, really? Now, do you know, here's a, do you know the names of, uh, of the flowers and plants that you're dealing with? Yes, almost all of them. Yeah, I've been schooling up. Because <laughs> I, I love sitting in, in uh, my garden. I don't do much gardening, uh, to be honest with you. My uh, wife Angela does uh, does more. But uh, I love sitting there. But um, and I, I occasionally want to write a poem, and I have to keep saying to Angela, "What's that one called? What the <laughs> purple one that goes like that?" Uh, like a feather. Uh, and and she'll tell me. And then I go, "Right, okay, I'm having that," and I'll, I'll write that down. <laughs> Have you actually written any uh, any poems uh, about your garden? I have, yeah. It's just starting to come out now into into my subconscious. I think it's, it's all of my metaphors seem to be plant plant and nature based. So yeah, it's, it's infiltrating the poetry brain. <laughs> I like that. I like. I tell you what, it does. It gives you an old new vocabulary, doesn't it? Yes. Because I, I don't know about you. I'm a very urban person. I mean, you you were brought up in Arnold, so uh, in in Nottingham, so so you must be quite urban. Yes, definitely. Yeah, all empty crisp packets and chalk on the pavements. That's my usual bag. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, no uh, I said my dad uh, um, lived in uh, Arnold. Uh, well, they uh, lived in Daybrook, which is right next to Arnold, in it for a while. So I, I know, uh, I know the area. Um, uh, so, uh, what was it like uh, growing up in Arnold for uh, for a poet? Uh, um, I, you know, did, did you did you think of yourself early on as a, as a poet? Oh, not at all, not at all. When I was at secondary school, it was all about art for me, really. I was always in, in the art classroom. We had a really eccentric art teacher, so um, she was good fun to be around. And I was always painting and crafting and, you know, building things out of paper mache. <laughs> so that was really good. But it was nice because Arnold, if you imagine, is just sort of like one long strip. And at one end, you've got Arnold Park. And at the other end, you've got Red Hill Park. Oh, so wow. as a teenager, we would just trait back and forth from park to park up to all sorts of mischief and seeing what was going on on the high street you know this is, this is, this is pre uh, uh pub crawling days you you park crawl would you exactly the park crawl you know it <laughs> there might have been a sneaky <laughs> bottle in our hands you know <laughs> yes, I, i've got to say uh, in bilbra where i grew up uh, uh, people had hang around the chip shop uh, um, I'm not I'm not looking for scraps I don't think uh, uh, um, or the uh, the pelican uh, boozer uh, no. with a bag of crisps that was that was a uh, the thing um, occasionally we went to the park of course um, <laughs> so uh, I'd love to get some poems in from you today uh, so uh, have you got a poem you could start us with 
I have indeed. So I thought I would start you off with a poem of mine called Alarm. And it's a very strange poem, but it it speaks on the, I don't know, the, the resilience of us as human beings in, in bizarre situations, which I thought was perfect for COVID. You know, now we all talk about Zoom and lockdown and things that were probably never really in our language before now. So uh, hopefully this poem um, is fitting for today. So... Alarm. The house behind us has been crying for weeks. The terraces, the terraces budged closer in to prop it up, and the birds stopped nesting out of respect. It's a wailing sound stuck on loop. It's all its windows are smashed from the pressure, its plants up past the chimney from the tears. There's no real sight of the house at all, just swamp oozing out onto the road and no one's got sky because the electricity lines have snapped in the canopies. None of us can sleep until our own terraces straighten themselves up again, beds no longer at an angle. But even with the trees gone and windows bordered, there's still the flooding and the wailing. The teenage girls have brought pyjamas and organised a sleepover to address the situation, asking, if it's okay and if it wants to talk, but some of them drowned in the night, so all communication has since been banned. So here we are, everyone in wellies and earmuffs, floating their kids to school in plastic boxes and shouting, morning, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you? And sleeping, standing up. (laughs) (laughs) Sleeping, standing up, that's a great image. (laughs) <laughs> um, I, I know you're on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I, I posted um, a, a post of uh, um, a great photo that was taken uh, of uh, quite recently uh, of whales. Um, and I don't know whether you know this, but whales actually sleep vertical. <laughs> I've seen it. Yes, they look like they're balloons, don't they, in the ocean? <laughs> balloons. What a great image! Oh, I wish I thought that's a great, great image. Yes, they do like them long balloons that you do. <laughs> uh, do, do you know it's a lovely, lovely thought. The first thing that came to me was that, that they face the light, mm. and and very often when I go to sleep, if I'm in a dark room, I, you know, I, I like to see a little chink of light, so I, I face the curtains, uh, and, and I wondered if the you know the whales had a similar. A similar sort of thing going on. Yeah, very possible. Uh, um, Les Dawson used to say in, uh, I think it was in Morecambe, uh, they uh, people don't die; they stand them up in bus queues. Uh, um, <laughs> the, That's brilliant. <laughs> it's not with wrong a bingo either. ticket in their hand. <laughs> yeah, on Arnold High Street. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, um, it must have been brilliant being uh, named as the. Um, a young poet laureate uh, for for Nottingham. Uh, um, did that co- come out of the blue? Uh, what was your reaction to that? Oh, it was a huge surprise. It, w- it really was. So when the um, when Nottingham City of Lit announced that they were looking for a laureate, um, loads of friends and family kept sending me the leaflet and sending me the link and saying, you must apply, you must apply. So I kind of got um, the courage from my friends and family to submit. Um, and of course, that's when the hope starts building, isn't it? When you start writing the application and imagining what you could do and what it would mean for you. So, yeah, it, it was a good, you know, few months of keeping the fingers crossed. And then when I made the final four, even then I was just so amazed, you know, after I've, I've been gigging for so many years as a member of the Mouthy Poets and I just felt like it would have been such an amazing opportunity. Um, so then to get the phone call to say that I'd got it, yeah. Honestly, I was on the sofa. I was ill that day, so I was off work. I got tissues all around me, not glamorous at all. Mm-hmm. And um, Sandeep Mahal called me, the director of um, City of Lit, and she said, "Well, Georgina, I'm just ringing um, to say congratulations." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I felt my heart stop. It was it was just the best day. And I immediately rung my grandma, who was in Top Shop with my auntie and I said grandma you never believe it I've got it I've got it I'm the laureate and I could hear her shouting to my auntie across the clothes die she's got it she's got it she's the laureate that's a great image as well your grandma in top (laughs) shot oh she's so trendy (laughs) you you need to do a poem about that yeah uh, on the phone in in top shop I was one of the judges I don't know whether you know that and I can tell you that it was unanimous 
there was no, uh, there was no, uh, uh, you know, just pipping uh, the post. It was, uh, it was uh, very much, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a great um, uh, sort of swathe of the, this must be uh, the one. And I tell you what, I liked. I liked the fact that you. Um, you do a lot for other people as well. You you know you do the uh, mud press which you set up and uh, uh, and you've been helping people around uh, Nottingham um, in various things uh, for for a long time and um, and that, that must be great. So tell us uh, uh, what what were you asked to do as um, as poet laureate? What were some of your duties? Yeah, so it was kind of like a two pronged role really. Um, one side of the role was writing for other people. So I knew that there would be a lot of commission work, um, you know, universities, schools, um, the, the Wildlife Trust, people who kind of had a message that they wanted to communicate and they needed. Uh, a mouthpiece if you like somebody to come up with that creative approach to, to giving the message so that was kind of one half of it and then the other half was um teaching really being in community centers in schools running workshops and bringing up the next generation of poets in nottingham um and there's so much talent out there in the schools at the moment it's it's incredibly impressive um, and, you know, to think, for example, Nottingham Poetry Festival, what that's going to be like in another five, ten years when those students start entering the scene and they start performing, mm -hmm. having been taught by this generation. It's really exciting. So it's it a now, great role. Now, I, I, although you were voted in 2017, they've not had a, a, um, a Poet Laureate since, so you're still... The undisputed yes. champion. The reigning <laughs> champion, yes. <laughs> it's great. I don't want to let it go. <laughs> and, and I know you, um, uh, you still work in schools, don't you? I mean, you're working in schools at the moment. Yes, that's right. So I'm working with the National Literacy, Literacy Trust, um, working with primary schools all across Nottingham, so from Clifton to the city centre. Um, and my kind of part in that is I'm trying to help the students learn to almost write what they know and write their stories and their lives. So we look at talking about their home and their family maybe and what they do for fun on their estates and realising that to be a poet you don't have to be this kind of you know euphoric um, creative genius worlds away from humanity it's just all about looking at your life and mining those details and looking at those creative things that you might not even notice like you just said about the whales sleeping towards the light that that is poetry so teaching people that They've already got it in them. It's it's such a pleasure. Well, I, I wish I'd had, had you as my teacher. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously you'd have had to be much much older, but uh, that would be good. <laughs> so, so I've got a poem uh, I'd like to read for you. Um, we, I noticed that when people write emails now, uh, we we all say, uh, "I hope you're well." Yeah. Um, you know, before you might have said uh, all the best or something like that. Uh, but now people say, I hope you're well or stay safe or everything. Um, and so there's a new sort of uh, thought process. And um, one of the things that happens in conversations, people say, yeah, how are you? And it's a very difficult one to answer, isn't it? Because uh, it's, uh, it opens a, a, a can of worms, as it were. Um, and uh, very often people just want you to say, oh, I'm fine. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and move on, especially if you are fine. Um, but I've written my little uh, response to that. So uh, this is, how are you? How are you? How would you like me to list my ailments? In alphabetical order, in chronological order, in order of annoyance, in order of severity and possible fatal consequences, in order of the obscurity of the medical terminology, in order of the, list, in order of the likely risk of contagion in order of compatibility with your own ailments, in order of social acceptability, in order of ease of explanation or ease of spelling, in order of surface area of skin or volume of body parts affected, in order of likelihood to induce nausea, in order of my favourites. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. I, I, I say it's what you're saying. It's about uh, writing what you know. Uh, and whenever I think of a subject, I, I always think, how, how does it affect me? Because because I'm the expert on me, but I'm not the expert. I don't like telling people what they should be doing and and that. Uh, um, and uh, your poems are very much, I know, come f through the filter of yourself, don't they? 
Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. I think it's just all about, like you say, you know you and you've got your own unique worldview, which you know, your poems are always hilarious. Well, I, won't, I won't say that. <laughs> they but, are very witty. You do wit so well. <laughs> but, uh, um, so when you're teaching in school, it must be difficult for because you, you've got to try and get them to to use, not, not to copy you, but to use their filter and 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 yeah. um, bring it out to them that must be quite a difficult thing it is definitely especially because if you think about it when you're at school 90 percent of your lessons and your subjects you're you know taught a formula or you're taught the answer and then you've got to you know put that into practice so it's very formulaic um so it's often a challenge at the start in the first session or so to get the students to kind of loosen up and tell them there's no right or wrong answer this is about your voice and your story um and often what's helpful is to maybe read them a poem by somebody else and show them how somebody's used their life as a reference and encourage them to to use that as a template almost and think okay this person talks about their favorite meal and what they do in the evening why don't you try and and put yourself into that um so that's a way around it but it's definitely a challenge yeah yeah now i know you um you've done something recently um uh on generation gaps this was um uh, was this a, like a commission who, who was commissioning it it was yeah it, you know what it was the royal shakespeare society oh my goodness the royal shakespeare company yeah it was a shock um to get the invite but i was you've done very well for a, for a girl from arnold i know you won't believe it would you <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was one of the milestones of my career, really, to get to get that invite. Um, and it was especially nice for me because the theme that they they put out to us was this generational gaps. And they were great because they said, you know, take it how you want, take it where you want. And fortunately for me, I have a family full of aunties and uh, the, my grandma, who was like the matriarch of all of us. So <laughs> growing up, I learned a lot of lessons from my aunties and, you know, I went to them for, for everything really. So it was nice to kind of say, here's a chance for me to write a poem about how my aunties kind of gave me the the worldview of, you know, being a feminist and being part of a community and part of a tribe and what that means. And so it was lovely to, to put pen to paper for that one. And I love the fact that uh, um, um, one of the most famous sonnets of uh, Shakespeare, uh, um, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, is basically the last two lines say, um, um, and normally people grow old, but you won't, because I've written this poem and you'll last <laughs> forever. Yeah. And I love the fact that you're doing this thing for Shakespeare and you're helping your aunties last yeah. forever. Yes. What a beautiful thing that is. I, I, have, you, have you got the uh, the poem? Um, yeah. I have, yes. I, I'll read it for you. Um, okay, so it's called An Auntie at a Birthday Party. That night, I counted the seconds between each flash of disposable camera to see how close the storm was. Around tables, girls discussed the boys fist pumping on the dance floor and decided it was him on the left most suitable for the look. They shared the same mac chili gloss, popped their lips, blotted the excess with napkins and admired the petals of the prints left over. One picked up a cardboard tie, held it to her collarbone and invited the boy into her selfie. <laughs> Seconds past the flash, another boy appeared and slapped the camera from their faces. Amidst the rutting of bodies, spilt drinks and squealing trainers on the vinyl came a woman. She wrapped her hand around his tall throat. In that grip, I saw all the doors she'd locked and the way she left the key in half turned so it couldn't be undone from the outside. I saw the radio she'd leave playing at night, its voices standing guard in the hall. I saw her little girl and how she taught her to recognise the nine on the keypad of the phone. By the time her hand reopened, he was standing upright in the middle of it, smaller than all of us, walking the lines of her palm. Every girl in that bar, camera flashes casting light shadows on their faces, looked from the woman's hand to their own and back again. 
<laughs> oh, very nice. I, lo I love all the detail in that. And uh, do you know, uh, the, I, I think the way we, we interpret poetry is very often we're looking for the things that we have in common. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's such a brilliant ending that, that we, we all do that. We're, we're looking, uh, we're putting ourselves uh, in 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 the uh, you know in the, in the place of the hero and heroine and, uh, and the villain and yeah. uh, empathising. It's such a good. Uh, um, it's one of the beauties of poetry, isn't it? Definitely, it's a bridge, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a way of uh, people sometimes describe it as a way of reaching out to other people and seeing if there's somebody on the other side. I definitely feel like that. Yeah. And yeah, and you, uh, um, I've got to say, uh, um, were again first choice when uh, um, we started the um, the Nottingham Poetry Festival, uh, and uh, I, I did the creative uh, directing for a couple of years, uh, and then I wanted somebody to bring in fresh ideas, and and uh, uh, you know, I've uh, I always like the world to be bigger than yeah. I am. Uh, uh, and so I, I want other people to 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 get involved. And uh, you were absolutely the, the first choice, and you did uh, um, uh, amazing things and took it from different places than I would in the two years. Did you did you enjoy being the creative director? Oh, I loved it. It was a daunting challenge, definitely, to kind of step into that role and and feel responsible for all of you know the scene for Nottingham. It was yeah, it was something I took very very seriously, but. Equally, there were so many laughs, so many laughs and so many great opportunities to say, like you say, what what could we what could be the next building block? You know, here's what we've got so far. What can we add and what can the next person add? So it was really important for me. I, I tried to take, a, again, a, a dual approach, which was how can we build the poetry festival up from the inside so you know more team members little departments if you like so that they can carry it on but also what can we plug into the festival which we haven't had before or we haven't had as much of before um which is why i really loved being able to bring in what we called headline educators so you had your headline performers as always but we brought in this education arm to the festival where you know famous if you like poets who are gigging and book, you know have their books out and are really ahead in their career were teaching anyone and everyone who wanted to come in and learn how to you know we had people learning about how to edit better we had people learning about how to perform how you how to create scratch shows we had people that were learning to write to prompts and, and responses which is almost what you have to do as a laureate when you, you're given a brief you've got to write that brief um so that was such a joy to be able to say or again, we're upskilling, we're, we're bringing up the next batch of poets and providing them that enrichment that you might not get in a traditional, you know, traditional education, really. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is very, very important. And uh, I was very lucky. Uh, I met um, uh, Ian McMillan uh, very uh, early on in my sort of uh, uh, career. Is a career the right word? Uh, um, journey uh, as, a, as a poet. And um, and to, to have a workshop with uh, Ian McMillan, uh, you know, and, and see how he uh, approaches uh, a subject uh, was great. So I love the fact that you uh, you extended uh, the performances and made workshops and uh, and lectures and uh, <coughs> um, meetings of uh, of people. And I know that's the, they're carrying that on and uh, and uh, expanding it. And uh, I love the accessibility. Uh, of the poetry festival um but sometimes you have to people won't come to the door you have to go and find them don't you yeah absolutely absolutely that's so true and especially with um genres like poetry you get a lot you know my background my family would never even think that they would understand a poem never mind be invited to watch a poetry show or take part in a workshop so that's something that we tried to do when I was talking about looking internally at the Poetry Festival, what can we do? And that's why we looked at um, hiring someone to help us do that outreach and go out to different communities and say, you are welcome. You know, don't don't be put off by the idea of all poetry. You know, mm -hmm. is it above me? It's not. It, poetry is in all of us and it's everywhere and, and everyone's welcome. And well, that, that was a, a joy to see as well. I've, I've got to say, I've done my best to show that poetry is not above us. Uh, <laughs> my, my poetry might be beneath some people, but uh, we're certainly not above us. Um, uh, 
I, 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 you see, I'm, I'm losing my ear, uh, Georgie, uh, uh, and uh, in, in, in common with lots of people, my dad uh, was about the same. Uh, he had that one, that one bit that he, he'd like pull over. Yeah, and neatly brushed down. Yeah, pride of place. I'm, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make out that I'm getting more intelligent by having a big forehead. It, That's it. it. So I've got a little poem that I did on, um, uh, on Twitter. Somebody uh, wrote something on Twitter about uh, losing your ear, and I thought. I'll, and, and I was quite pleased that it, that it fell into play. You know, sometimes when you write a poem, it just falls out of you. Yes. So this was, written, this was written in about five minutes and it just fell out of me. But I, I thought it was a lovely little poem. It's called <laughs> My uh, My Hair Has Gone On Her Head. <laughs> I wonder how much hair has been cut from my head. What length it would be now if I'd left it instead. Would its ends still be blonde, the middle bit brown? The roots faded grey, white at the crown. A colour-coded record of my life passing. Not scattered landfill, still amassing. <laughs> you like that one? Amazing again. See, how can you say that you're not witty? You have well, a... yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, uh, um, it's, it's just a... It, it's... Um, we make light, don't we, of, of our... Um, uh, of our imperfections yeah. uh, uh, because we need to come to terms with them, you know. Uh, um, and I, I think it's one of the things that humour and poetry do very well, that they teach us to, uh, you know, to, to come to terms with our imperfections. Definitely, definitely. Now, on that, uh, on that uh, uh, bombshell, um, I think we should get take some questions from the audience, uh, uh, as I am an imp. imp- Perfect uh, um, questioner. Um, let's see. Uh, let's have a look on Q and A. See if anybody's. You can read these out as well, Georgie. Uh, um, now, no questions at the moment. Do send in your questions uh, for Georgie. Um, uh, whilst uh, whilst we're waiting for that, I'll ask you something. So you moved to Grantham recently. What what was that about? It was for love. What a joy! What a wonderful reason to move. <laughs> so for love. For love. Yeah, yeah, for my man. <laughs> so you know, I, I, that that is the best reason to to move, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm in Brighton uh, uh, for for love. Um, if you'd have moved to London, we, we might have been. <laughs> might have had some problems. Might have been pushing it, but, but Brighton uh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, hundred percent. Yeah, just before COVID, I was living in a flat share in Baseford with six of us. Um, and it was just, it was mad. It was mad. Six of us, one bathroom, one tiny kitchen. You know, it was, it was a lot. Um, so locking down in that environment was just terrifying. So my, my partner at the time said, come and stay with me, um, you know, just for a bit. And then a bit turned into a bit longer and a bit longer turned into a bit longer. And here we are. And I'm still a bit. Now, uh, uh, just segueing into that, uh, uh, Lauren uh, is asking, um, what has it been like? uh, Was it been like creating over the lockdown? Oh, yeah. Really hard for me. I I really struggled at the start because I felt like... um, I was struggling to concentrate and I needed to do um, hobbies that didn't involve your brain and like intense focus, which I think is why I fell into gardening so much because normally I read a lot as well. I read novels really often, at least one a month. And in lockdown, I've barely picked a book up. Just being able to sit and focus and not be worrying about, right, well, I'm freelance in a pandemic. As soon as I lose this contract, that's it, I can't pay my rent as soon as I lose that contract that's it that's my car insurance gone so I struggled but what really helped me was taking part in workshops because I always find facilitators in workshops are really good at creating this little bubble of a space where they just draw you in so much that all you can focus on is what they're telling you and the richness of the work they're giving you so that was my saving grace really yeah Yeah. what about you um, well, uh, I watched Frozen 2, and um, it said, uh, just take the next right step. 
uh-huh. and, and I, I, you see, that's where I get most of my uh, philosophy from <laughs> uh, uh, um, kids' movies. And and, uh, and I think that's the thing. you just got to do the thing that's in front of you. Now, when we first went into lockdown, of course, it was different. So you, the rhythm of your day was different. So I found that uh, actually quite inspiring that, that you had a different... And we've set up, because my son's autistic, as you know, uh, we set up a very... Uh, um, a good routine because essentially for the last uh, year and two months there's just been my wife Angela and me looking after Johnny we, we had no uh, help at all uh, um, and uh, and he needs uh, looking after 24 hours a day so um, but we got into a rhythm of it but I then found something within that rhythm that I thought well this is different uh, and and therefore um, I, I was able to to write a bit about that I think the problem is now we we're, we're a year two months in uh, I'm thinking, you know, that's that's now become a bit, um, you know, we're a bit too familiar with that. Yeah. And I think when you're trying to uh, um, look at the world in a different way, you, you, you need change. Absolutely. Uh, um, so I'm the, moving out of lockdown, I'm hoping there's going to be uh, as creative uh, for, for me. But thanks for asking. Now, uh, somebody's asked, uh, what did your aunties, this is Geraldine, what did your aunties think of uh, your poem? Well, they loved it, especially because they were all there at my birthday party when my auntie did, in fact, get a very ridiculous boy by the throat and put him in his place. So it was a source of great amusement um, at, the, at, the, at the family table. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, brilliant. brilliant. Um, now, uh, so we've got some more here. Let's have a look. Uh, Georgie, you did a great workshop online last year. Uh, are you going to do another? Yes, thank you. Yes, I know what that is. It was our lockdown writing sessions. We would do um, a couple of hours live every Tuesday um, of, of reading poems, or I would try and think of a theme and bring poems to the workshop um, that touched on that theme. And then together we would respond to them in, in our own, you know, on the other side of the computer at our own homes. Um, and it was great fun. And yeah, I now that it seems like this lockdown is going to continue, definitely I'm going to restart them because it was a joy for me because I got to read lots of great poems and hear lots of great poems but also again just help people to write and have that little bubble of creativity and somebody saying that they've been enjoying uh, your Instagram garden updates well thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to share them I'm so proud of it I honestly can't believe how much um th- how much kind of stimulus that you get from planting a tiny seed and then watching it grow and desperately trying to protect it from the slugs with you know copper tape and all of that trying to give it a chance and then finally seeing it bloom and seeing the whole garden change it's so addictive you know you go out every other day and there's a new thing blooming Um, and equally there's something else that's keeling over so you've got to try and make them work together somehow and and constantly work within that change that's sort of going ahead even without you you've kind of got to keep up with it so well, well I've got to say that the, the way I, I look at uh, the garden is I planted lots of uh, wild I say I planted Angela planted lots of wild uh, flowers and yeah. the idea being well they're wild so you don't have to do anything to them that, that's <laughs> yeah. the, they're supposed to do their own they live in the wild they're supposed to do their own thing uh, um, and uh, we can just admire the way the wild works then. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got to say, uh, if you, you know Angela, it, um, uh, the garden looks a bit like a 80s ear at the moment. It's, uh, it's, it's very, it's doing its own thing. Good, I bet it's a great look. I'd love to see it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to follow you on Instagram and I'm, I'm going to put a little garden update of my own up on Please there. Do. Please do, please yeah. do. Um, so now, uh, hey, you've got a book coming out, haven't you? Yes, yes, I have. Um, So the publisher is officially announcing next month. So this is a sneak preview of the announcement for everyone who's joined us here today. So thank you, everyone who's here. Yeah, it's my debut poetry collection. My first time in full print. Um, Congratulations. Now, what's it going to be called? So it's going to be called, I think, I'm 90% sure it's going to be called Hagstone. Now, do you know what Hagstone is? it's obviously a type of stone is it a stone with an hole in it yes it 
it is. Oh, it's the hole in it. Go yeah. on. Which point? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. I'll send you one. (laughs) So a hagstone is a stone with a naturally occurring hole through it. And there's kind of some folklore, witchcraft kind of mythology around it that if, say, like you keep having a load of bad luck or things keep going missing in your house, your car keeps breaking down, you think, what is going on? If you have a hagstone, you're able to look through the hole and it possesses a magical power to show you if you have been cursed, if somebody sent changelings into your life, little fairies, you know, to run around and they're hiding all your things and they're, they're breaking your car. So I loved the idea of thinking back to my life when I was growing up, wishing that I'd had this hagstone to look around me and show me that is a bad idea don't follow that path you're going to get you know jinxed if you do it or it's going to have bad consequences and equally I like the idea of the book being a hagstone for the readers so they can look through into some of these mistakes and lessons and stories and maybe take something away from it for their own lives so a little bit of magic little bit of um you know writing from the self um and I just love I love witchcraft so <laughs> there you go I think it's a great title uh, I watched last night uh Nomadland have, have you seen it no I haven't well there's a bit in that where she looks uh through uh, the hole in a stone and oh. now with you giving me that extra information it's made me think of that scene now in, in a different way uh, so thank you for that um oh. It's, it's a lovely thing to be educated because, uh, you, you know, it, it makes the world richer. Uh, um, now, I'm, I'm really looking, I, I, I was hoping you would have a, a, a book out well before now. So I'm glad you've held back and, and I'm sure it's going to be brilliant when it comes out. Um, now, uh, so uh, speaking of poems, um, can we have a, another poem? Yes, you can indeed. Um, so I thought I would read you one from a section of the book, seeing as we're on the topic. Um, So part of the early section in the book looks at um, family dynamics, but also it's got this underlying um, exploration of power, Mm -hmm. who's got power when, and what it's like not having power. So I thought back to my childhood when I was living with my mum and my stepdad and, um, you know, my dad would promise to come and pick me up at the weekend Um, You can imagine how that went. So this poem is sort of about that and about being powerless in that situation. Um, So it's called Suitcase. Suitcase. I can't remember what the case looked like, only that it must have been big enough to carry a weekend and that regardless of the room, it was always unzipping itself. In the kitchen, it rolled out, gawking in front of the table as I ate. The flap of its opening the flap of its opening, a mouth trying to form the words. I would sit in the hall by the door, press my face against the glass and watch it fog. As each breath cleared, I'd pray to see his silver car. Sometimes it took 692 breaths before my mum appeared with the phone. The walks back through the living room to unpack were the worst walks of shame I've ever known. My father, uninterested. Stepfather, gloating. At night, the case slept under my bed. When dreaming, it had spin its wheels as if rolling, and I could tell a nightmare from the pace. By morning, it was out again, unzipped, prompting as if an open arm, calling me in to be held. What a beautiful poem. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Do you know... uh, I found that um, the most difficult things to write about um, uh, are actually the most important things to write about. And uh, I hope that one's in the book. Definitely. (laughs) It is, thank you. And and, and the the great thing is, by sharing that, there's other people going to have felt that. uh, um, And it's sort of, I think think it uh, helps us all when we, uh, uh, you know, especially when it's done so well, uh, as, you, as you've done there, uh, to uh, not to hide these things away. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think poetry does that well, because in a way, 
that story that you've just uh, given us there and the images that you've just given us there wouldn't sit well in a, a, in a novel if you get flooded by other detail. Yes. Uh, um, so there's only one way of communicating that. Yes. In, 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 its, in its purity. Yeah. Which is poetry. I love that. That's, 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 that's one of the good things I love about uh, poetry. Um, it's like a snapshot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sort of, um, I think it, it conveys emotion well, doesn't it? That, that That's the thing. Definitely, yeah. Like you say, it's, you're trying to capture the mood of a moment, aren't you, rather than tell a whole complete story. It's just a snap, a snippet of, of, of one view. Definitely. It is. We're getting lots of nice comments on the on the chat facility there, saying oh. how, how lovely that is. Uh, um, and they'll probably send you a copy of this chat after afterwards. Now, oh. let's have a little look. We oh, we got some questions on the uh, the Q and A. Here we go. Uh, what do you do when you have creative block? This is uh, from Courtney. Read, hundred percent read. Before I write any poem, I pick up a couple of poetry collections off the bookshelf and start reading poetry, and it kind of unlocks that part of your brain. Um, so I think writing and looking at things poetically is different to your everyday brain, isn't it? And sometimes that creative block is because you can't access that part of your, your brain that looks at the detail and, and makes you know metaphorical comparisons. So 100% read other people's work. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I do a bit of reading, but the other thing I do is I like to go somewhere I've not been before nice. uh, or stand somewhere I've not been before and, and uh, try and look at the world uh, in, in, uh, from a new position, from a new point of view. Um, that, I think that helps. Mm -hmm. um, and talk to people. Yeah, um, you know, uh, and uh, understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's good. So um, it says here, uh, this is... Anonymous attendee. Well, I don't know if I should read this. Way. I should. I will do. Uh, uh, do you like writing poems to commission, or does that feel too different from someone that's more that's something that's more art felt? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, I I I like writing to commission because it's like going to the gym. You, it challenges you to work hard to write something that you wouldn't ordinarily write about. For example. I once got commissioned to write a poem about Lord Marsh bus station. Yes. Now, can you imagine? That was quite a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you happen to be positive, it's quite a challenge, yes. <laughs> yeah, especially now, now, goodness me, yes. So um, it, it teaches you to kind of go, okay, here are the nuts and bolts of what I've got to write about, yeah. but how do I make that creative and do it in a way that gets it across to people so I enjoy it but I, I think that the two years that I spent as poet laureate writing to commission and writing for other people is also what pushed me to write more poems from the heart much like that suitcase poem I've just shared it sort of made me feel like I need my outlet yeah, I, I I don't tend to write commissioned uh, poems. Um, uh, well, I don't, nobody tends to ask me to be honest with you. Um, but um, what I do do is um, I, I do a radio show every about eight eight months, and uh, for BBC Radio Four. And, and what I do is I pick a, a subject, uh, and then I write for the subject. So I try to filter the subject through myself, but I do a lot of research on it. So in a way, uh, that's uh, that's got a similar sort of feel that it's not coming directly from yourself. It's coming from your journey and adventure in, into, a, into a subject. So I've got a little poem uh, um, for the next one, which I'm doing. So the next one's about aging. It's called A Normal Aging. So I was looking at um, what would happen if you became immortal and people's attempts to become immortal. And apparently the first emperor of China uh, tried to be immortal. So obviously he got lots of money, yeah. uh, lots of people to do his bidding and uh, and sort him out. So you think if anybody's going to, you know, in, in the past might have sorted it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, then he would. Um, so there's a little poem called Chasing Immortality. The first emperor of China, trying to avert his last breath, took mercury, which inadvertently somewhat hastened his death. <laughs> now, you see, I, I researched it and I found that little nugget that he'd actually took mercury and it had killed him. And, <laughs> and, and I thought, if I, can, if I can capture that in four lines, 
Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a little irony there. Uh, and uh, and I love the, the, the rhyme of China and Trina. Yeah, me too. It really works in a northern accent. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and inadvertently, uh, I liked, because uh, it sort of slightly rhymes with Mercury. <laughs> and then, uh, um, you know, uh, death and breath, obviously. So, um, do you know, I have a great fun writing little ditties. I, that, 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 I, I, can, I can have half hour to myself just yeah. playing with words. And it's, it's as good as a Sudoku or a crossword or something like that. It's great fun. Now, uh, there's a question here, which I think we've already answered, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll um, say it anyway. Um, do you both write in a Knots accent and do you read in a Knots accent? Uh, I, th I think it's pretty clear we do, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I think so, yeah. Especially sometimes if I've had to gig in London, I'm sure you've experienced as well, Henry, yeah. you get a slight um, nervousness about your accent and then you realise it's even more important to make sure you stick in your accent and represent the home turf. <laughs> Do you know, I didn't actually know I got an accent because everybody around, when I was growing up in Nottingham, everybody around me spoke That's the same. <laughs> so uh, I used to think the people on the television had a daft accent. Uh, um, but uh, obviously, uh, I've, I've lived in uh, Manchester and uh, Chesterfield and Hull and, uh, and Brighton. And... Um, I I can't shake my accent. In fact, a strange thing um, is I'm uh, I've been here for 24 years now. And my my son's uh, brought up a, a southerner, but because um, he speaks to me so much, he's got a Nottingham accent as well. <laughs> no, that's bring, good. I like that. Strange. So I'm bringing up a southerner with a with a Nottingham accent. Uh, um, that's pretty good. Now um, I've got a, a question here from uh, uh, Veronica saying. Um, do you what's your opinion on form oh tricky so form i think is a great tool to go to if you've got a poem that you're trying to write or an idea that you're trying to communicate and you're struggling to get it to come to life form is a great way to force yourself to communicate um, concisely, to perhaps the rhyme, if, you, if you're working in rhyme, it pushes you on, the momentum of it pushes you on. Mm. Um, so I think it's great for that. Um, and it brings a great lighthearted energy to your work as well. Um, but sometimes I feel like if I know there's something that's pouring out of me and it's coming out in more of a free verse, I try to just let that happen because also on the other foot, form can sometimes restrict you. If you're restricted to, you know, particular syllable count or a particular line length, it can chop your idea off at the knees. So mm. I think it's useful and it just depends on where you want to use it, like, like anything really. Yeah, yeah, I I write um, mostly uh, in uh, uh, sort of free verse and blank verse, but um, I do um, I do occasionally so something just falls out and it and it's got a, a form. Now, obviously, I, I do ditties and I, I love playing with uh, longer uh, poems with rhymes, uh, um, but sometimes even a serious poem can can come out in, in a form uh, and I, I've written sonnets and uh, villanelles and things like that when, when it suited the uh, uh, occasion yeah. um, but um, yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a strange one I, I think if if, um, if if the subject matter and what you're trying to say uh, um, is the first concern that's how it should be and then the form should be the second concern um, that to me. Uh, yeah, agreed. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got another one here. As I say, there's a big Scottish community in Corby by the old steelworks. There are young people there who have never lived in Scotland, but they still have a Scottish accent. Do you know that's, that's nice? You no, know, I, I know about that because I, I performed in uh, in, in Corby. Um, it, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a testament to community, that isn't it? When you think about it, it is. Yeah. Um, so let's have a see. We're we doing we're doing all right, actually. Uh, we're doing all right now. Um, we there was another thing that you've done that I wanted to ask you about: apples and snakes, black box. Um, yeah. So tell me a bit about that. Yeah. Okay. So um, apples and snakes 
run well they run lots of things if you don't know them definitely check them out they're they're a great um organization that support poets doing all sorts of things um but one of the projects that they do is called their black box series um and it's a youtube channel dedicated to searching for um contemporary poets that are working in the scene you know gigging and performing and, and being published or whatever you like to consider the scene as um now today um and they invite you to come and read some poems in this amazing studio that's set up like a black box and they do really sort of moody lighting over you and you've got this microphone down in front of your face it's proper a, a fancy setup <laughs> yeah. um, so i got invited to to read a poem for that and it was just yeah again just an absolute joy i chose a really a really short one um called becoming a street lamp <laughs> um yeah. So can we see that on YouTube if we go into That's so right, yeah. Type uh, Georgina uh, uh, Wilding into, into YouTube. That, that'll yeah. probably come up with it. It will, absolutely. And equally, if you search for Apples and Snakes on YouTube, you'll be able to see their whole channel and um, all the poets that they've booked for that. So it's great. Right, well, we, we're, uh, we're coming near to the end. So uh, have you got a, a poem uh, for us? I have indeed. Um, what shall I read you? I am going to read you. Um, I'm going to read you a love poem to end with. Okay. Why not? <laughs> so after this this year, year and a half we've just had, we've all had to get used to um, long distance love, haven't we? Um, be it for our relatives, be it for partners, people that we uh, aren't in our bubble um, and wishing that we could get to them and, and send things over to them. So this is a poem about a long distance love I once had um, that moved to London. And it's called Scent. It goes like this. I want to write poems with four legs that can carry themselves down the M1, slipping under cars and wedging their corners between the pipes to hitch a ride and get to you quicker. I want to write poems with four legs and a brain, sniffing out that tube ear smell to follow. So poems with four legs and a brain and a nose, and they sniff from street to street, fold themselves up, slip through your letterbox, climb the stairs and know which room is yours because they found the trainers that perfectly shape around your feet by the door. And they come in and they sit and they hold their tail. They have a tail now. And they howl at you from the end of the bed. And they howl at you from the end of the bed. And they howl at you from the end of the bed. And you wake up and you look at their eyes and they fold themselves flat again onto your lap and you hold them and you pet them and they won't come home. Oh, that is beautiful. Well, a brilliant poem. And, and uh, you know, you know when somebody uh, says they're going to do a love poem, so you, 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 you immediately have an expectation yeah. of, of, of love poem. And that confounds all those expectations uh, cool. and, and circles round and, uh, you know, uh, uh, gets to you. Uh, I lovely that. That's, that's a great poem. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, being my me, uh, me, me guest. Um, have you enjoyed it? Very much so. It's made me miss you and miss being in a room with everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, hopefully, we, you know, uh, as we come out of uh, lockdown, we'll, uh, we, you know, we'll all get together and be doing stuff soon. And uh, um, it would be lovely to to see you, uh, um, you know, you know, doing stuff around and getting a, and selling your book. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, we you, we can buy this uh, Agstone um, uh, from what uh, um, sort of November December. That's right. Yeah, pre orders November December, and you should have it in your hands April May. Right. Okay. So uh, we, if we type that into uh, in, into Google, some something will, will come up. All right. That's right. Uh, and so ne next week is the final one. Uh, um, they've gone quick. We've done, I've done ten all together. Well, this is uh, number nine. Uh, so it's uh, Pete Ramskill next week. You know Pete, don't you? I do very well. Another fantastic poet. <laughs> yeah, he's brilliant. So he's he's uh, from Southport, uh, but he's uh, he's been in Nottingham and brought up two lads in Nottingham uh, over the past. Um, Oh, 20, 30 years. Uh, and he uh, used to do a lot of work on um, Radio um, Derby uh, on Terry Christian's show back in the day. Uh, but don't hold that against him. Um, so um, looking forward to seeing you all uh, next week. I'm, I'm going to end with a poem. But first, I'd like to thank again the Nottingham Poetry Festival, uh, Inspire, um, Metronome, uh, Confetti, uh, Notts County Council, 
the Arts Council and NTU for all uh, giving us this platform and helping us to, uh, to talk to you. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to finish with this poem. It's called uh, Lightning Before Death. I, I, we've had love, so I thought we'd end with death. Uh, um, but it's not about death, it's about life, as, uh, as most poems about death are. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was thinking about um, when people are in a coma, there's this thing that, um, often, that I said to often occur, that people wake up from the coma just before they die. Uh, as you know, maybe they're, they're just you know um, wanting to make a final farewell. Um, so this is uh, this is um, inspired by that. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, I hope you enjoyed today. It's called Lightning Before Death. The music is not made in the radio; it comes from elsewhere. The mind is not seen on an X-ray. Who are we to say there's no spirit? Let me whisper a final farewell, remind you of who I once was. More than biology and chemistry, more than mere physics, someone individual, someone unique. If I linger in your thoughts, it's this part of me that stays. It was always the part that was me, connecting with the part that is you.